It hadn't been obvious to mainstream American science fiction that cities are like compost heaps, just layers and layers of stuff. In cities, the past and the present and the future can all be totally adjacent. In Europe, that's just life. It's not science fiction. It's not fantasy. But in American science fiction, the city of the future was always brand new, every square inch of it. This is a podcast about buildings and cities. I'm George Gingell. I'm Luke Jones. And we're back for the second part of our discussion of William Gibson's Neuromancer. Although really, actually, it was just too long, so we cut it in half. (laughs) That was a quotation from William Gibson in an interview with the Paris Review. And we rejoin the party, the hacker case, the Razor Girl, Molly Millions, the... um, Crew of Space Rasters. The crew of Space Rasters, the um, sort of thinly rebuilt... Uh, in sort of insane ex colonel Armitage slash Quarto. The computer ROM driven sidekick in his thing, yeah. and the godlike artificial intelligence floating around on the internet. And they're on free side. Well, I, I, would, I would start with they're on a tugboat. They're on a Rasta tugboat. Oh, ship. they're on the Rasta tugboat Marcus Garvey, but they're on their way to free side. Is Marcus Garvey like a. Uh, is that like a reggae singer? No, Marcus like Garvey is he's a, like a political guy. Oh, okay. He, he appears he? in um he, Is it a real person? It's a real person, yeah. yeah. I d I'm shamefully ignorant about what he did. But I know um Black Star Liner has something to do with Marcus Garvey. He's um he comes up in a lot of songs. Maybe someone can write us an email. <laughs> yeah, we're 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 very white. Yeah. <laughs> we're some yeah. of the whitest boys in East London. Oh dear. I don't think that's even nearly true, actually. So, we're on the tugboat. We're on the tugboat. We're making our way to a luxury resort in the shape of a giant cylinder. Which spins around and around to create artificial gravity on the inside of the skin. Yeah, so this is an absolutely classic. This is our first real classic sci-fi destination. Yeah. These things have been around since, in fact, in science fiction, since before the space race. The, um, it's either a donut... Um, which has the problematic thing that there's a massive surface of an- of like anti gravity on the s- which has a ceiling mm. or a cylinder which doesn't have a ceiling. The sky is the middle. It's that classic like it's a metal tin can spinning in space, but it's such a large scale that it has lakes and rivers and farmland, mm. and light is redistributed by a system from the sun. Is that what's happening, or is it just a big lamp? Yeah, I don't understand. It's one or the other. Yeah. There's this like millimeter wide, millimeter wide filament in the middle of this massive, yeah. multi kilometer long thing, which sort of zaps the sky into existence. Yeah, and this one is another like old sci fi idea, space resort. It is a constructed holiday resort, and it is sort of made out of an artificial collage of various kind of Condé Nast destinations, you know, Riviera. It's got a ca- it's got the sky recorded off Cannes. It's got Bermuda beaches. It's got, you know, Brazilian waterfalls. Yeah. It's got all these sorts of aspirational travel. You know, I don't think there actually are yachts parked on it, but which would be kind of nice. I like this idea of like being in the swimming pool, in the yacht, in the fake ocean, in the orbital satellite has got a sort of... But uh, there are people flying their little microlights and gliders yeah. around and... Um, and it's Bronzed but, teenagers yeah. with gleaming teeth. They're very much the rich kids of Instagram, the yeah, kind the, of... The gilded yeah. youth. Yeah. They're very gilded, they're very healthy, they're very tanned and they're all having a lot of fun. It's per- sort of perpetual spring break. Ski chalet yeah. people. Yeah. And it's about the, the resort seems to be really a sort of gambling resort, yeah. Which seems to be one of the big assets and the yeah. home of this like billionaire clan, Tessia Ashpool, uh, who've got a kind of decaying mansion at one end, yeah. And they run this. They built it libertarian. Yeah. Libertarian in the sense that it's just capitalists. Perhaps libertarian yeah. is wrong. Liberal. It has a slight Vegas tinge to it as well at one point it's described as like a big funnel and you pour in all of the people and they pass through a sort of mesh which just keeps the money yeah and that's uh and that's kind of how it works but people seem to be having a lot of fun have you been to vegas 
Yep. What was it like? Quite strange. Well, I was a child, so I couldn't drink. Oh. Huh. Or gamble. So all you can do is look at the very strange buildings, which are all incredibly far apart from each other. That seems to be how everyone... As an aside, <laughs> why does everyone in the world, all these other places that aren't here... I mean, we're moderately bad at it here. Build everything so far apart. Well, parking. Parking. Yeah. Roads. You have to create all the space for all the parking. So, yeah, I remember at one, one point you described it as a sort of Nespresso commercial. It's yeah. Kind of, um... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, even, even, Even the sex in it is sort of like... Yeah. You know, the things that are being, like, pushed over as... Uh, uh, you know, and spilling out over the floor definitely are kind of like Nespresso yeah. capsules and um, very Instagrammable. You could definitely have that like sort of sunset bikinis, fancy drinks, complicated food pictures. It's got all that kind of all that kind of vibe. Still um, all made of like stapled together foam though. Between the trees, on gentle and too cleverly irregular slopes of sweet green grass, the bright umbrellas shaded the hotel's guests from the unfaltering radiance of the Lado Ageson sun. A burst of French from a nearby table caught his attention, the golden children he'd seen gliding above the river mist the evening before. They looked a case like machines built for racing. They deserved decals for their hairdressers, the designers of their white cotton ducks, for the artisans who crafted their leather sandals and simple jewellery. Leather ducks? What are cotton ducks? I think, some kind ducks. Of, I think it's some kind of um, sportswear. I don't know. Is this, this reminds me, again, this is a complete like insane transgression, <laughs> but I'm afraid you're going to have to put up with them because they're uh, of... Um, Los is like the ultimate, like the future man who is dressed all in jerseys, <laughs> like jersey woolens. And there's a picture of him, and he's sort of like strong <laughs> and modern, <laughs> got yeah. all this funny knitted sportswear. So they've all booked into a hotel, which is another one of this this kind of this set of interiors. While various unspecified preparations are going on, they're kind of casing the joint. They're casing the joint, but also a key thing has to happen, which is that Riviera has to perform his function, which is to beguile the heiress to the Tessier Ashpool, the, the current heiress or uh, present member of the family, the lady Three Jane Marie France Tessier Ashpool. So the way the family works as a sort of... I mean, I think it's probably worth yeah, explaining let's do it, this. Let's do it. Is that there are a few people who um, have taken various approaches to immortality. Jane has done it by, like, clo- like a succession of clones. Yeah. So three Jane is the third clone. And there's eight Jane banging around somewhere. No, eight Jean. Eight Jean. Oh, it's another one. Yeah, there's a man, there's a man and a woman um, who are kind of in, in control. And of the t- of the two, but there were originally rather more clan members. Yeah, well, of the two, of the two, they have they're all variously sort of cryogenically frozen. Um, and except that the the clan was originally founded by Ashpool, who's a man, and um, Tessia, who's a woman, uh, who is the Marie France, and uh, she is um, she's dead. But yeah, Ashpool is frozen, and Three Jane is a sort of a bit of a strange. Character, slightly twisted. Yeah, and... she's definitely like one of these people born in and has become a bit of an enfant terrible. Yeah. Uh, and has got new ideas. She's a, She wants to be a mover. So this this sort of seduction, as it were, will take place at a special show that Riviera performs where he does this very elaborate and uh, rather horrible, sexually violent um, uh, illusion show, but which is exactly right up her alley. There's, there's there's a couple of shows. This is a sort of set piece that has a reflection. Earlier on, there's a like fight, which is holographically projected as well. Yeah. And the show, both shows have a similar thing, which is where you sort of have all these people in the background, seemingly in kind of top hats, clapping. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. yeah. And um and then like people are being like sliced apart on yeah. the, on the screen, and that is that's that's the model of entertainment that's actually, and he does he does his sort of version of that, which is also. Has various other plot things in it, which I think we can probably just leave to I people's own read through. And various other things happen. Case manages to score some drugs and go on a sort of a binge, although to no real consequence. It's kind of fun that it sneaks in, though. I think maybe we can talk about it later. There are. This book has. I mean, the thing it reminded me of is I got halfway through Dashiell Hammett's The Thin Man. Hmm. Drugs are like alcohol in that book, in that 
attempting a drink along, you, you would die. Yeah. It's not... I think actually Dashiell Hammett does it slightly more in that it's... Like they drink so much. Certainly yeah. in the first bit, it's more than a drink a page. Yeah. But it's kind of like that. Everyone yeah. is always drinking. Everyone is but getting, not, But, but pretty consequence-free, really. I mean, yeah. there's little bits of it. And Riviera is constantly being topped up with drugs by Molly, um, which yeah, is her... Which he, sort of shut, he sort of, like, loses his magic. He's like Samson, shorn of his hair. If he's not on, what is it, it's like barbiturate and, or, like, amphetamine yeah. and something else. Kind of speed, sort of speedball-ish kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, some concoction. Sort of, sort of thing that poly- polished off um, Fashbender. Oh, there's a nice thing when he's asleep in his, like, drug-induced coma, he, all these little platonic solids revolve around his head. It's kind of cute. So at this point, it appears that everything is in place for the plan. The plan is going to go like this. Riviera is going to let Molly, is going to get 3 Jane to let Molly into the Villa Straylight, which is the the redoubt and HQ and sort of haunted house of the of the founders own, owners of the space station and the seat of all their fabulous wealth and then simultaneously case and and the construct will do all of their stuff in cyberspace and it will all happen and the procedure for unlocking the hard locks on wintermute is extremely uh, elaborate and it involves doing the same thing simultaneously in both of these spaces so in the cyberspace and in the real space a, a kind of password has to be or a password or sort of pass gesture has to be sort of unlocked at the, at the same instant in order to release it um, you need you need a magic word spoken to a head to a disembodied head yeah to this sort of it's an, it's um an automaton it's, it's a, an automaton a mechanical it's a cat as an, do you want to? Can I do another tiny aside? Oh uh, yeah, very quickly. There's a category of objects which is like things in boxes or automata, which crop up a few times. Yeah, which are sort of like which are the art of the art objects tend to be sort of assemblages in boxes or at top, or top. They tend to be sort of mechanical or assemblage things, uh, which I think has a reflective thing of the sort of accreted or like dissociated objects. But at the moment that the, the plan is finally ready to go into action. Case returns to his hotel room to find that the Turing police are there. I got muddled up with this the first time. I wasn't sure if they weren't the... Are they the, 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 the teenagers? No. No, they're not they're the teenagers. They're a different bunch. Yeah. But they, he may have... Yeah, no, I think they're different. So the Turing police are, in a way, the most apparent sign of, like, state or governmental power in this world is the ability of the, the, the Turing police, whose mission is to prevent... There have, there have been treaties which have been set up to prevent sort of super AI from happening, basically. Yeah, there seem to be, there seem to be like... There seems to be sort of intergovernmental cooperation, but no governments. Um, and they're cooperating to prevent these AIs from achieving excessive capacity. From getting and, free and... And um, uh, destroying the human race and all this kind of thing. Yeah, but we don't care about that Yeah, too much. no, we don't. We're going to... We're gonna, they come to his room, they make him take all his clothes off and interrogate him for a bit. Then they walk him. They're not officially allowed to be there. Um, or, or it's ambiguous. But they're going to get him out by subterfuge and they're sort of walking him very subtly through the grounds at gunpoint when... You're going to read it? Yeah. Well, you mean you need to imagine the um, all these little tussly hummocks... All these people lounging, it's like, it's like drinking a sort cocktails. of highly inhabited golf course, and they're all kind of f- like French. They're they're sort of hard-bodied kind of Tony Erdman, uh, McKinsey employee. <laughs> yeah, sort <laughs> of like Interpol. The whole place is French. French is like the language of sort of luxury. They followed the railing to an ornate iron bridge that arched over Desiridata. They were a little over a quarter of the way across when the microlight struck, its electric engine silent until the carbon fibre prop chopped away the top of Pierre's skull. They were in the thing's shadow for an instant. Case felt the hot blood spray across the back of his neck, and then some, someone tripped him. He rolled, seeing Michelle on her back, knees up, aiming the water with both hands. And then he was running. He looked back as he passed the first of the trees. Roland was running after him. He saw the fragile biplane strike the iron railing of the bridge, crumple, cartwheel, sweeping the girl down with it. The gardening robot took Roland as he passed under that same tree. 
it fell out of the groomed branches, a thing like a crab, diagonally striped with black and yellow. Yeah. So the AI's got them. It's killed them. Yeah. It kills people all the time. Yeah. Don't want to cross it. No. The crab it's things in, are quite... ingenious. Like, in the background, everything is run by little, like, insects. Robots that sort yeah. of crawl out of paws. Okay. The kind of maintenance bots are little. Yeah. There are other people who've done that. But yeah. We don't need to. Yeah, sorry, we don't need to have a comparative like maintenance bots of the nineteen <laughs> seventies. But, bots but like best, insectoidal yeah. in, um, maintenance bots of the seventies is definitely a thing. So he's running away, completely covered in blood. He's somehow able just to go back to the hotel and shower. This world is so full of dissected. <laughs> this like so full of like vivisected corpses yeah. that no one would bat an eyelid. That neatly brushed out of the way. They think they ought to get on with it. So the final location, the final like sort of quarter to a third of the book is spent between cyberspace and the Villa Straylight. And the Villa Straylight, I think it, it's quite an interesting setting. Yeah, can you describe how you think it looks? It's, so let me see. I've got, there is a little quote here. Well, I, I was asking that as a question because there are descriptions, but they leave a lot. They leave a lot open. I think it's a, an extension of the cylinder in one direction, up towards one end, which is important. They're on a train. Yeah, it's getting narrower. So it's a sort of a spindle. Yeah, which narrows at the end. It would be very like as an aside again. It would be very interesting designing that train. It would have all sorts of strange forces going on. It would have a lot of imparted angular momentum as it went. Yeah. In it should because it would be wanting to accelerate yeah. round. You'd feel very ill. <laughs> There's a little funny essay. The Villa Straylight is a body grown in upon itself, a gothic folly. Each space in Straylight is in some way secret, this endless series of chambers linked by passages, by stairwells vaulted like intestines, where the eye is trapped in narrow curves, carried past ornate screens, empty alcoves. In Straylight, the hull's inner surface is overgrown with a desperate proliferation of structures, forms flowing, interlocking, rising towards a solid core of microcircuitry, our clan's corporate heart. The, like, the main body of the cylinder, which is this sort of simulated uh, landscape, outdoor space. The villa is, is like entirely internal, and it's, really, it's made up of lots and lots of corridors and lots and lots of rooms. It's also a different sort of, for me, a different sort of description. Whereas the, a lot of the descriptions of places are like the sort of descriptions of the details that you have in a stage or theatre, this feels more like a higher sort of fantastical description. It reminded me more of, you know, like the Library of Babel or something in like a, is it Stanislav Lem, Rem? Lem. You, Lem, like, you know, the, the funny castles of the, like robot knights or something it's got that kind of fantasy thing and i think it isn't something that you could would make any sense if you drew it i think it's an idea of it's got mythic character it's warrenous and semi-symbolic it's a you know like it's warrenous like a like like a motherboard but also like gormenghast yeah like a gothic fantasy but that's just that initial description. It's yeah. a little bit different when we're going round it. The, what you're told right at the start in this cryptic message conveyed to Case, um, which refers to a memory he has of a wasp's nest in this early teenage... This kind of teenage memory of, of the, su the suburbs of the sprawl, a hot day in the suburbs of the sprawl, trying to burn a wasp's nest. And with a flamethrower. With a fl with a, you know, everyone has a flamethrower in the sprawl. And... Um, all the Everyone cool, who's interesting. The, Every, anyone you'd want to know. All the cool guys. And this sense of this, the kind of the internal structure of it and also the lurking horror in the middle of it, of the wasp, the factory where all the wasps are being made. It's and funny that's... because it's like the description of the wasp's nest, like there's a sort of cosmic terror in this wasp's nest. It's sliced open and he sees they're like... It's like weaponized biology. These yeah. agents of poison and destruction pupating in a factory. Yeah. And it's really, the, the, the gaze is really like vicious yeah. in his horror. 
And up until this point, the Tessier Ashpools have seemed rather like sort of decadent and slightly baroque and dysfunctional. Yeah. But it hasn't... There isn't much else to say that this is the Warren of the Beast. Yeah. They haven't really done anything. But the more that we... Dis- as we venture further and further into the house, we discover just how much the family has rotted from within. The, the, the kind of outward perversity of Three Jane, which is not really... Not, of which not very much is really made, is is kind of magnifying and darkening the, on the inside of the house. Yeah, and we are. I think we are meant to see this as a, this this kind of we're going into a, a kind of horrifying place. We're kind of going into the into yeah. the house of horror. I think I must have read it wrong because for me, like definitely the nastiest people are the protagonists. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder. I don't know. Well, we'll get to the Ashpool. I think is quite a bad character. Mm? Yeah, yeah, there are, yeah, yeah. So this is what it's like inside. The low vaulted hallway was lined with dozens of museum cases, archaic-looking glass-fronted boxes made of brown wood. They looked awkward there, against the organic curves of the hallway's walls, as though they'd been brought in and set up in a line for some forgotten purpose. Dull brass fixtures held globes of white light at ten metre intervals. The floor was uneven, and as she set off along the corridor, Case realised that hundreds of small rugs and carpets had been put down at random. In some places they were six deep, the floor a soft patchwork of hand-woven wool. Funny place! So you see what I mean by it slipping out of the world? Like, like the rest of it is quite a believable, kind of like golf course like highly maintained sort of synthetic nature. We are now in something which is fantastical and baroque. It's filled with museum cases which themselves are filled with mysterious old things, none of them whose meaning is really apparent. Full of rooms, full of old desks. It's and got furniture. the same. It, the, it's sort of pop. It's sort of an expensive version, a luxury version of the piles of detritus in the Finns yeah. rooms. You know, people. There's a point when someone open. They're opening up these. They're like looking for something. Opening up drawers, 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 and the drawers are like yeah. a broken telephone manual, a robo gauntlet, some other sort of. You know, you know, it would be like a fetish mask and a. And a, and a, yeah, as, as in a sort of tribal one, and um, like a set of spanners. It's funny that the, there's sort of luxury and there's sort of posh things, but there's also just a lot of there's a lot of crud around here as well. And even in this place, things are badly fitted. Yeah, there's a moment where they where they talk about this door which has been imported, this like big ornate wooden door, but which has then been really badly sliced in order to fit it into this strange curved concrete corridor it's it's kind of i mean and and the fact that there's like these piles of rugs yeah. of, which i presume are basically persian rugs yeah it's like i was saying it reminds me of if you've ever been to liberties of london there's the um the rug showroom up on the top floor somewhere which is the best place and you can surreptitiously like sit down on the pile of rug and bounce up and down it's very nice it's on the second top floor second top floor okay uh yeah it's like on the top of one of those big galleries. Quite specific. I mean, the details in this, yeah. I mean, moving, is, where do you think that comes from? It's really... Strange, yeah. Strange. Also, that they're small. Sure, you go to country houses and they do have lots of Persian rugs because the floors, but they're like big and sort of specific. Yeah, no, these it are like, like little... these drifts of... Sort of like prayer mats. Of like, prayer mats. Yeah. Yes, it's very, very bizarre. Also, the, the doors which have been cut down... This is a really strange detail. I mean, when we meet when we meet the like decadent and alive Ashpool, which we might as well do now. I mean, that's one yeah, of the things which Molly runs into on the yeah. Way. I don't think we need to do the whole plot. It can yeah. still leave people something to read if they feel like doing it afterwards. Um, but if I describe just the just the environment, yeah, you know, there's and in fact, I think we can sort of have that approach where we don't yeah. like nail down what, exactly what happens. But he's in a sort of uh, smoking jacket with um, embroidered slippers. Hmm. Everything in lots of things in his room are are the the the, the mattress is covered with another mattress. This is one of the two non <laughs> non foam ones. Um, is covered with and his pillows are made of the same material as the prayer mats, hmm. which also sort of is festooned everywhere. 
And then there's lots of things like drink decanters. Oh, and there's a workbench, and there's we covered in kind of with covered in more like silicon as yeah. everything is. Um, and yes, yeah, so there's lots of sort, sort of, of velvet. It's very bizarre. Uh, also, also a, a dead woman in the bed. Yeah, just for a little touch. He's they're, in... they're, they're like they're everywhere. Like you might, <laughs> in this book, you might as well assume they're sort of they're the same corpses, corpses all over the place. He's um he's defrosted one of his like clone daughters and then killed her. But he's only been defrosted himself. Like, yeah, he's a few been, hours. He's previous. been re-defrosted, but in a slightly like confused yeah. and um, messed up state, which significantly. Yeah. But I mean, that's what the the rooms are weird. I think this is one of the things which I find quite like interesting is you don't need to know very much about him because it's all in his room yeah but without it although the room i think if you got a few people to like describe in detail what they imagined the room to be like i think you'd get quite different things yeah because there are there are a few tells there's a few little things but the description is like that it's just what we've described is the totality so when i initially imagined it i imagined it light with sort of daylight and window but then I, when I did it again, I put it into this warren and imagine it as a sort of red velvet lined badger's den. It, you know, and the descriptions kind of allow for either of those almost. The other reference which it reminded me of are these sort of surviving old museums. Things like um, the, the, the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, piled high with all of these ethnographic collections and um but sort of like uh, also the product of an obsession a creative yeah a creative person like you know one of these like run down collection you know the something collection museums it's kind of said sedim- it's like this kind of sedimentary process isn't it like the archaeology has been laid on so thick here that the the floors are six deep in carpet the first time i think i i, I thought about it as a bit like pit rivers and yeah. things reading it closely it doesn't sort of say that. It feels quite empty. Occasionally a thing is described, but it feels to me like this blank place full of, like, carpets. Mm. That's the main thing that's described. Well, like, the carpets are everywhere. The cases line the walls. Although, they d- again, they don't really fit because they're all boxes and the corridors are all curved. Yeah. This kind of archaeology of junk equals hidden knowledge. Not necessarily power, uh, but only the kind of power that, like, hidden knowledge brings. Yeah, because, I mean, there was another genre of things, which is the, like, hidden art collection that I was thinking about. Mm. Tintin, Mustafa Mons, various other ones. But I don't think it's that either, because a lot of this stuff is just junk. Yeah, no one looks at it. It might be very interesting. But like, it's there are of... definitely interesting things, but there's also just a lot of, a lot of the stuff that collects in, draw- in drawers, you know. But it's also a bit like you've got lots and lots of display cases. They're full of they, the stuff they have in them is unordered, and the way that they're distributed is com- kind of unthought out and doesn't make sense. And it's sort of like pages and pages of writing that doesn't make any sense or something. There's lots and lots of information there. There's lots and lots of that archaeology is incredibly should be kind of incredibly rich with meaning, but it's incomprehensible. Mm. There's no logic. There's no, you don't get any sense of the intelli- of the intelligence that's produced it. The, the reason I'm saying I think it's mythic is because it doesn't, like most of the environments, kind of make some sense in terms of their occupation. But yeah. this family is still like running businesses and stuff, and they're still sending people around to do things. Although, but inside, it's just a warren of corridors. I think a lot of it just runs automatically, though. Yeah, it's like robots looking after corridors. Yeah. Straylight reminded Case of deserted early morning shopping centres he'd known as a teenager, low-density places where the small hours brought a fitful stillness, a kind of numb expectancy, a tendency that left you watching insects swarm around caged bulbs above the entrance of darkened shops, fringe places just past the borders of the sprawl, too far from the all-night click and shudder of the hot core. There was that same sense of being surrounded by the sleeping inhabitants of a waking world he had no interest in visiting or knowing, of dull business temporarily suspended, of futility and repetition soon to wake again. Like a lot of these statements about sort of um, whenever like activity is encountered, yeah. it says a little bit about Gibson's then worldview, I think. 
Yeah, I think because like sub- there's no sub- point where like actual activity is deemed to be a good thing. Suburbia is kind of a like is a bit of a sh- sort of horror show, or it's like it's the kind of horrific object. It's I suburbia. I think is very important to the general story of cyberpunk, but the stillness is the stillness of like I mean, I guess that is saying that it's got this strange anticipated like emptiness because they're away. Yeah, because, because they're away. All the family has sort of ceased to be. They're all in in storage. Yeah, they're all cloned. The thing just runs itself. The big funnel, you keep pouring money into the big funnel and it keeps collecting. There's not really anything else. Yeah, and somehow the entire activity has been furred up. Uh, there, there are bits in the description of it which suggest that it's continually morphing. It seems to me that it's morphed until it's entirely corridors, really. Well, they. I wanted to say what happens when they encounter three James mm. zone. Yeah, yeah, that's important. Which is interesting. The, so the, he, at a certain point... Yeah, I mean, well, we can kind of gloss over it. That it, the the plot contrives it so that actually Case and the people he's with have to physically go into the house themselves as well to get Molly out of a scrape. And as they enter Three Jane's area, all all that decor starts to be stripped away, and we start to just see concrete and steel again. And eventually, we emerge into her area where the whole it's intestinal maze of corridors has been flattened and this enormous curving very very um sort of low ceilinged room has been excavated out of the tangle and i imagine i imagine with sort of the sort of ends of corridors poking in everywhere i think i mean it's literally like she's got around with a sledgehammer and smashed everything down yeah there's bits of broken stuff all over the place and there's a, and all she's got is like this huge big open area, vast. And Nothing a, in it at and all. And then a swimming pool in it. Yeah, a yeah. swimming pool. And it's really low. The edge of your vision is just the curvature. Anyway, strange place. And this is the sort of, um, at the end of the detective story, this is the, the drawing room into which the characters are taken for the denouement. Yeah, and they'll have a, they have a fight. Um, there's a sort of various, den- yeah, various the, 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 the denouement happens. The denouement happens. People generally get what, sort of more or less what they deserve. While Case is in cyberspace doing his part of the, the sort of heist climax, he runs into the other AI yeah, who then sucks him into this much longer and more extended dream sequence, which takes place rather than unlike Wintermute, Neuromancer is able to create he its has, own. Yeah, he has a special power. Yeah, its its power is sort of different, so it's able to to create both to store the personalities of people really, and also to uh, the cr- sort of notion is that for various technical reasons, it can sort of actually recreate. And he finds himself he finds himself actually not back, but rather in a new place, which yeah. is this uh on a abandoned sort of silver beach in the half light, where he spends a long time living like what seems like days, living with Linda in this like shipping container, washed yeah. up on the beach, surrounded on a sort on a beach strewn with all of these yellow, kind of rehydratable ration packs. And yeah. it's this curious Sort of semi, semi kind of Arcadian cargo uh, cult. Yeah, but it's also a landscape of ruins in a way that taps into earlier traditions of these. So I was thinking a little bit about the the Hypnorotomachia polyphily, where you have this dream of desire, which the hero goes into, um, which is a landscape, a strange landscape filled with with the ruins of of the glorious past. You know the great statues and the fragments of columns and things but in this case I wonder what it is that because I was thinking of the Fisher King and I wonder what it is that reaches for these sort of really archetypical because it's very I think it's I think it's blankness reaches to sort of archetype and there are there is sort of manna from heaven and consumerist crud decay or like or like globalized economy crud it's a sort of shipping container yeah it's the ruins of the globalized economy isn't it um which are strewn on this virgin yeah landscape beach without much but it's not like they're not on a on a desert island in it doesn't really matter what happens there no no but there is more nostalgia and sort of uh notions of um desire 
yeah. are played out in various ways. And also there's the the plot thickens towards the end of the book. There's a lot more the sort of pacing changes through the book. The beginning is really tight yeah. sort of exploration of spaces. There's this middle chunk which is we go to a place meet another character, we go to another place, meet another character or characters. Yeah. This sort of creeps up. And then then there's a sort of slab of people talking and doing to resolve it all. Neon forest, rain sizzling across hot pavement, the smell of frying food, a girl's hands locked across the small of his back in the sweating darkness of a portside coffin. But all of this receding as the cityscape recedes, city as Chiba, as the rank data of Tessia Ashpool essay, as the roads and crossroads scribed on the face of a microchip, the sweat-stained pattern on a folded, knotted scarf. That's kind of all that maybe. And we then should... it and then it resolves. That yeah, I think we won't say that like or, or anything that much more about the plot there's an enjoyable bit in cyberspace where their method of entry in cyberspace is this enormous militarized chinese virus called the quang yeah, yeah. which turns into this in like vast mirrored sort of polymorphous surface thing which sneaks up to the corporate ice of the Tessia Ashpools and and kind of dissolves into it. Yeah, yeah, it's like a coral open. sort of digesting its neighbour or something. Yeah. Um, and that's all quite fun. And there is, yeah, there is this, this sort of like dragon ride through um, through cyberspace on the back of the virus at dizzying pace into the sort of annihilating brightness of the um, of the climax of the plot. And then it's over, or rather, it's not really. They w- they wake up and everything's okay, and they've got lots of money, and yeah. w- Wintermute and Neuromancer have merged and gone away to do their thing. It's fulfilled all its promises to them, and um, there is an interesting a moment which I thought was worth bringing up. Yeah, Molly's a bit bashed up, and she has to go back to Chiba to get some surgery. The two of them. The two of them have got together during the plot of the book. I'm not sure if we actually said that, but um, like that instantly, I did, did, yeah. uh, got together. Sort of, they just sort of. Um, there wasn't much courting. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's the future. But there's a good bit where, for whatever reason, she's having her surgery. They go to so while she's having her surgeries, he goes back to the bar that we were in at the start of the book. And goes to see the barman and says, um, you know, hey, it's me. And uh, he says, I came back. The man shook his massive stubbled head. Night City is not a place one returns to, artiste, he said, swabbing the bar in front of Case with a filthy cloth, the pink manipulator whining. I mean, that feels like, again, that feels a bit like um, Peter Pan. No, he can't go back there. It's weird. Why does he want to go back? He's still actually in love with the the life. Yeah, I mean, the beginning is so much about fantasy fulfillment. You know, this character, he has a schizophrenic image in lots of ways. Yeah. He's a bit of a schmuck, but he's an action hero. His his self-destruction, the horrific nature of his condition, is really just that he has so much desire, sort of physical desire driving him on. It's got this sort of addictive thing, but it has a lot of satiation. Yeah. One of the really key things for this character, one of the things which is a sort of deep thing within him, is that he must get high on drugs a lot. And that's a sort of, it's a sort of spiritual resonance, not in the sense of like getting high off, microdosing off LSD and seeing God, but in the sense that um, in this sort of wasting yourself, there is some like, like real pleasure. Um, You know, one of the, one of the key culminations of the book is he gets to replace his pancreas, which has stopped him from taking lots of drugs, yeah. with one that can take them again. Yeah, that's like that's like one of the things. It's like one of the really key things. He's got it back now. He can have speed again. But he doesn't. In fact, you know, the end of the book is that he settles down, gets a job, like an actual job. Yeah, uh, I, I wasn't sure if it was an actual job. But it's certainly sort of something steadier. Him and Molly never see each other again. Yeah, yeah, which is a famous uh, last line, isn't it? Yeah. So, in fact, that is the end for him. He never do- he never can go back to Night City. And in a sense, it feels a bit like a growing up story. 
But I think there's a little... I had a little whinge about consequence and motivation. The motivations are strange, and the consequences are kind of limited in a sense. It feels very much like one of these stories which is about going away and becoming a grown-up. That aspect of it I didn't find as satisfying as I did in some other of those stories. Like, I think it was more satisfying for me in Train Spotting or in A Clockwork Orange or in... Which are sort of vaguely this topic. I mean, I know they're in extremely different tales of, like, mad life followed by growing up. Or just sort of getting out of the... Yeah, getting yeah. out. But, I mean, like, becoming like go, becoming a normie. But in both of those cases, like... It's in a, a very lot twisted more, way. Like, yeah, it's a lot more ambiguous and there's a lot more consequence and confusion. Or rather, the, the things that happen matter a lot more. I think it, it, the, the strength is his great insight into extrapolating the trends of his day and imagining these sort of consequences of these various things sort of pushed. And to an extent, a lot of those trends did continue somewhat. Um, and that makes the places interesting for me that like it's quite the the kind of the kind of genre aspect is quite fun you know you can kind of get on board with the fantasy fulfillment a bit even if bits of it i found slightly but i think that's because i'm not so used to this sort of genre work Mm. i don't read a lot of it there are things about this book which we did have a talk about that the character's motivations don't always seem to add up in the round and that in particular case as a character the way in which he develops can seem a little bit incoherent um and but i think for me that is a, an element of what i kind of enjoy about the book which is that i think it seems like the one which has the most sort of gibson not necessarily autobiography but kind of um you know the autobiography of feeling in it and that what is a bit absent in later Gibson books is uh, the kind of self-loathing, you know, the narcissism and the nastiness. You know, Case does all these random things. He goes on this, like, weird drug binge for no reason. He is um, really angry in ways which he can't fundamentally explain. I think, fun- like, one of the things about his anger, and I think one of the things which perhaps you've reacted to as being incoherent is that there's an anger in the character which is like really intensely felt but which he can't quite articulate what it's about and that the articulation of what it's about that's given is unconvincing because in you know in my reading because the anger is just real you know it's that kind of inarticulate kind of rage that lots of people have a little bit of and which you can't explain it because it's just it's just what it is, you know, it's just there. And I think that that's an aspect of a lot of people's experience of being a man. And it's a thing which, in the later work, Gibson, I think for reasons which are sort of creditable, does lots and lots of protagonists who are women, sort of never again goes back to this kind of protagonist. But he also fundamentally makes it a little bit, l- they make them flatter. Yeah, I mean, it is part of The Rebel yeah. Without a Cause which is definitely part of that, as an archetype of that yeah. anger. It's an archetype of that anger when you can no longer be Achilles, you grow up in suburbia, in a safe world, is part of that. There are sort of genre answers. It's a consequence of actually trying to inject a little bit of realism into this character, and it doesn't sit comfortably together. I, I mean, I would say, like, within the genre of science fiction... Like this is by no means the most jarring example of this that you might encounter, and actually, it's it's a uh, an extremely well written book. I mean, it's definitely been a success in the number of readers, and it's been incredibly influential. And it's very enjoy it's very enjoyable. I'd strongly recommend reading it if you haven't. Um, yeah, in terms of its reception, it won the Hugo Nebula and Philip K. Dick, which are the three big science fiction prizes. And it should have done. It's quite right to have done all that yeah. because it's a tour de force of science fiction. Yeah, I'm not sure whether to do my kind of critique. Maybe I'll put it... We can always decide whether to put it in or not. I think you should. I mean, I think that there are also... I've basically read all the books multiple times. And I think I've become increasingly aware of the way in which, like, some of the things which are less good in the some of the later work is also latent here. 
and I think that in I think this connects to what I really enjoy about the book, which is that this slight edge of sentimentalism, which I think is the thing in Gibson, is really cut by this nastiness, and that the it's you know it's there it's there in things like the fact that poor dead Linda gets to live in this sort of heaven of the neuromancer consciousness. It's there in the way that Case goes off and like settles down and has like a nice life afterwards. It's the there in um, in the way that like there's a moment where Molly kind of gives like this long narration of um, Molly, who is herself a character who's appeared in previous short stories, talks about this other character that appeared in a previous uh, Gibson short story, Johnny Johnny Mnemonic, and how and this kind of you get this sort of what is it? you know it's this it's this kind of sentimental story about poor tragic Johnny and what happened to him. He didn't have a great like wisdom about the truth of human relationships and what makes them interesting or tragic and happy and mm. like conflicting. And when he was trying to inject a lot of that, it tended to be clunky. Like it, it tended, it's, it's like there's Linda, which feels very mechanical and yeah. kind of slightly it was to me slightly gross. And like the end of Case's story is also like that's also William Gibson, isn't it? Like he's been wandering all over the place. He's been doing all this kind of counterculture stuff, but actually, you know, in the years before writing this, he's settled down in suburban Vancouver and is living a very happy life with his wife and kids. Like yeah. that, you know, that's happened to him. And I think that happens a lot. Settling down, it's rather like I said, I don't think he spent much time working in offices because he doesn't say anything interesting about them. And these different environments of humans settling down is a very interesting and very challenging thing. But I don't think he can t actually, I don't think he can turn this sort of merciless gaze on his own extremely happy domesticity. I don't think he can bring himself to do it. I think that maybe just to close out the programme, the two things I'd like to do are to talk about why he's worth reading and also maybe to give a little bit of an overview of some of the books which we're not talking about. I think Gibson is someone who stands, who sort of, between a lot of things which increasingly are quite important and current, this sense of that he has a particular analysis of technology, the way technological progress and development works, that he has a particular analysis of the city and of sort of places and things and objects. Somehow we've managed to get this far without mentioning the most famous Gibson quote come cliché, which is that the future is already here, is just not evenly distributed. One way of unpicking that is that Gibson is trying to sort of puncture the um, the kind of heroic sort of science fictional mythos that he'd encountered um, in which scientific inquiry and technology appear as this sort of Promethean uh, kind of heroic sort of self-conscious pursuit dragging society and culture into the future as part of this broad spirit of scientific inquiry, whereas his um, vision of technology is something which just happens like background, radiation, the sort of half-life of um, cultural and social development is the production and absorption of new technology, which accretes around the edges of places and things and in ways which are never really anticipatable by the inventors or anybody else. Dipping into the Paris Review interview, he has this nice moment where he remembers as a child, he, he says, um, yeah, he sort of developed these obsessions with these particular images and what they would seem to connote to him. He says, I would see perhaps a picture of a sunbeam alpine sports car and infer a life in England. I always held on to that and it migrated into my early fiction where I could create an imaginary artefact in the course of writing and infer the culture that had produced it. And I think in the context of architecture and design, this process of elusive, metaphorical, slightly kind of dream-infused process of reading objects and, uh, objects and elements and figures that's the sort of Proustian moment or an archetype, something, a, a small symbol yeah. or a signal or a thing evokes a world. 
associated with it, which can be an artificial world in the case of Gibson with his life in England, which is a synthetic one taken, you know, patched together from scraps. There's a particular category of Gibsonian sort of Proustian moment. It's not like an evocative memory. It's like an everyday, pro- it's like product. It reminds me slightly of, at the beginning of Towards New Architecture, very famously, there is the Bugatti sports car and the Acropolis as sort of measures of progressive civilization in its states. And it's the, the engineered product, which in that is, is, an, is, is standing in as an archetype. The Gibsonian, like, tell... The little thing he has that used that because something one of the strengths I noticed in the writing is that there is an economy there there is an economy in the images there is no economy of images they there's huge numbers of things that are described, but they are described briefly or like what sort of archetype is this, and how does it reflect on the way of looking you know archetypes of prose that might like clearly make someone a hero or a, a romantic one, or um, a stream of consciousness, like things that would be summed up in consciousness. Yeah. He's not so, you know, or lots of other things. It's a particular sort of artifact. Normally the moment is someone exercising strange, perhaps not entirely thought through, but nevertheless wonderfully unpredictable kind of um, autonomy within a... Uh, the bounds of sort of available and cheap stuff. So that the, I was thinking um, there's this great moment in one of, in his most recent book, which in a way is the kind of the resurfacing of something which you see over and over again in his um, fiction, but someone in a sort of a near future, uh, like trailer park in the, um, in the sort of South, rather than clearing out this disgusting old um, camper van, has sprayed an inch thick layer of transparent silicon all over the inside, and so that all of everything, you know, so that all of the carpets, but also kind of cigarette butts, coins, um, bits of old kind of mould and fluff, are all encased inside this sort of uh, kind of snow globe paperweight surface underneath it. And there are these moments where, I mean, what do you read from that? You just read. It's not. It's not really heroic, is it? But I guess uh, what well, I, I would think... immediately read from that is 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 is, is, is incredibly evocative because yeah. you can imagine. It, I mean, that feels like a metaphor for his process in general: the layering together of two things that exist into yeah. something new, and projecting it into the future. We understand like lamination or yeah. encasing things in resin, yeah. and. Um, and the properties that has, you know, it makes it into something that you look at yeah. in a particular, you know, re- the recontextualization through plastics. The Neuromancer is part of a trilogy of novels about the same setting, the Sprawl trilogy. Um, and would you like to, like, in two sentences, characterize? I know we've been characterizing it a long time, but what you think? They're the same. They're, I think that in the later books, it gets a little bit more. <laughs> Here's a moment, by the way, if you just seem really clever, because I can, you can just cut that question, think about it for a little bit, and then give a pithy answer. <laughs> yeah, the later books, the later books get a little bit more into the kind of the subject of kind of AI. The yeah, I think we sort of get into the territory of the sort of human machine singularity a little bit. Also, there a lot of actually a lot of themes which have been going the whole time to do with sort of the body, the, the modification of the body the kind of eventual fusion between the human and the machine, all of these things come into it. And do they take place in this sort of but it's the grimy, same, stuck together city? And... It's in the same setting, yeah. It's the same, it's still this kind of scrapyard, compost heap city. Then there's the Bridge Trilogy, which is set much closer to the present. I think it's meant to be sort of 40 years or so into the future, uh, which is set in and around San Francisco, uh, where the big Bay Bridge which is now being demolished, I think, um, gets dis- sort of disabled in an earthquake and then becomes this enormous sort of linear shanty of kind of hipsters, basically, sort of in strange fusion. Is it, is it like Brixton Box Park? It is a like, bit... Like it, everything made of plywood and OSB and everyone selling, yeah, like, like multi-adjectival foodstuffs. It's like a sort of box, a sort of refugee camp by Box Park. 
but they're still interesting and there's lots of themes to do with sort of augmented and virtual reality and uh, also sort of slightly more to do with media the portrayal of media is a little bit more recognizable things to do with sort of reality tv and then there's a final trilogy where he moves the action one year into the past so each book is set at the year before it was written which is really all about advertising. It's quite enjoyable. The recurring character is this guy called um, Hubertus Big End, who's an enigmatic Belgian sort of Rem Koolhaasian advertising executive who has, I think... I think it's an uncharacteristically sort of Dickensian yeah, yeah, name, yeah. isn't it's it? Like, you know... <laughs> it's quite good. Or, and um, um, they're, they're fun, and they're, they're really all about... They're sort of about counterculture in the era of sort of hyper globalized networked society so they're all about their things these things which are sort of hidden in the most obscure corners of the internet or these um sort of fashion labels which are nameless and also produced uh, kind of appearing at random there has this sort of weird character who is her tick is that she's allergic to really effective branding and so what um when um one of they they she has this sort of sideline in being exposed to new uh brand, oh new, see if she has a, like a reaction yeah 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 just if she becomes get extremely the naughty, like, yeah, yeah, get the new get the new hermes thing out and let's see if it works <laughs> if it makes her very nauseated then they know it's really good <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> It's good. This all seems this all seems funnier, basically. Yeah, like Neuromancer wasn't very funny. It was pretty good, but it wasn't funny. Yeah, I think that the, certainly the last three are quite a lot funnier. Uh, right. Well, I think we should wrap it up. Yeah. So I'm um, sorry. Sorry we <laughs> sorry we spent like three hours talking about cyberpunk dystopia. Why are you uh, sorry? Uh, well, we'll I'm be not, back. We'll be back with other stuff. Don't I'm not worry. Really this sorry. is just a brief discursion. I think. Um, yeah. We've got some. We've got some. We've got some hard nerdy, uh, got some hard nerdy architecture coming up. Yeah, yeah, we've got lots of great stuff to come. Um, you can always find us at aboutbuildingsandcities.org. Emails at aboutbuildingsandcities at gmail dot com, and just yeah, have tell your maiden aunts about us. Yeah, uh, don't do drugs. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what else. That, you can't, you, <laughs> Luke. You can't say that without keeping an even remotely straight face. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs>